On this week's episode of My Take Radio, the MMA segment is back. We're talking UFC Fight Night. Going to give our fight picks for this weekend's UFC event, plus some of the MMA news of the week. On the wrestling side, of course, it is the road to the Elimination Chamber, which goes down this Sunday. And I'm going to break down Raw, SmackDown, 205 Live, and all the latest wrestling news of the week. The MMA and wrestling edition of My Take Radio starts right now. This coverage is live and uncensored, so if you have any small children present, you may want to have them leave the room. What's going on, guys? My Take Radio, episode 394, powered by Rageworks. I'm your host, Rich. And first of all, I want to thank you for hitting download and checking out this MMA and wrestling edition of My Take Radio. If this is your first time listening to My Take Radio, My Take Radio is a variety show covering mixed martial arts, professional wrestling, gaming, and entertainment. Uh, we release these shows weekly with an MMA and wrestling edition up first and a gaming and entertainment, sometimes with a little tech sprinkled in a second episode during the week we usually release them uh mma and wrestling between wednesdays and thursdays and usually gaming and entertainment between thursday and saturday schedule still been a little funky so i'm trying to create a more standardized schedule so we're still kind of working the bugs out but nonetheless uh we're giving you your weekly fix of mma and wrestling goodness this week last week the mma segment took a back seat as we were incredibly incredibly deep into a lot of wrestling stuff last week, including, obviously, the road to WrestleMania, the Rumble, plus our very own Jay Santee stopped through to chop it up. So we were we were definitely swamped, and it would be a disservice to try and give you guys two-plus hours uh, to try and, you know, do a short subpar MMA segment and then just put all our energies into the wrestling. I figured, you know, it would take a back seat, and I know a lot of you guys enjoyed it. We saw the numbers, and I am very, very grateful for you guys uh, you know, obviously taking the time to check that out. And we're going to continue fine-tuning it, like I've been saying, uh, since we stopped doing the live shows, that we're going to try and keep everything, you know, 90 minutes, about 45 minutes a segment for each show. Sometimes they're going to run a little more. Sometimes they're going to run a little less. But I'm going to try and keep it uh, tight, obviously being respectful of the time that you guys take to listen to this. No need to make you guys sit there for two-plus hours when, you know, we can give you a 90-minute dose of, information that you guys can enjoy uh besides that um a couple of other updates mtr 400 is rapidly approaching we're actually going to do a live show for that that is going to be march 1st uh we're going to go with our 11 30 p.m 8 30 uh pacific standard uh wow <laughs> we're going to go with 11 30 p.m eastern 8 30 p.m pacific for that as usual and that will be a live mma and wrestling edition of my take radio of course we will make sure to put information for that uh, usually the week prior with an announcement as well as details on how you can listen, watch, and participate in our Milestone 400th episode. Uh, a couple of other things we got on deck. We got Toy Fair uh, starting February 18th through the 21st. We're going to be covering that. Uh, myself, uh, Jimbo Slice will be there some days. Uh, my wife and I will be there on other days. But just keep it locked to all our social media accounts for that stuff. I had the opportunity to visit our friends at Mezco. Mezco Toys uh, was kind enough to invite us to their offices in Long Island City. Um, of course, if you've been watching the news when it comes to New York, you know that New York had some really, really, really inclement weather. It was it was really bad. And that was partly the reason why we didn't record the show earlier on Wednesday, just because we had to get out to Mezco early in the morning because they informed us that they were not going to be canceling that appointment and instead we're going to 
you know, just try and accommodate everything because they really didn't have any other time to do it. So as a result of that, I ended up waking up substantially earlier than usual to get on our commuter rail line here and make it over there in time to check out the stuff. And I got to tell you, uh, you know, trudging through the snow sucks. Much respect to my Canadian brothers and those of you in areas where the snow is just absurd during the winter time. It was it was really a pain in the ass. And as a lifelong New Yorker, you know, we're used to it. But we try to find ways around it. Usually, if it snows, I, I you know, I either take the day off or, you know, if it's something super bad, you know, I make sure that, you know, we got food and stuff here in the house just to avoid any unnecessary trips outside because that's when the worst shit happens. You try and they tell you, hey, stay off the roads and you try and pull some pull some shit. Oh, I'm going to make this quick run to the store before you know it. Your car is wrapped around a pole or or somebody hits your car or just unnecessary headaches. So I try to avoid dealing with that. And I've been pretty successful. This was one of the few times where I actually trudged out willingly. But as I said, it was because, you know, we were visiting Mezco, checking out all their toys uh, well in advance of Toy Fair. We took a ton of great photos. If you guys have been following Rageworks on Instagram, you probably have seen some already and also on Snapchat as well. And we're going to up to update more photos from that over the next day or so. And like I said, for Toy Fair 18th, uh, February 18th through the 21st, we're going to be there just giving you guys kick-ass content for that stuff as well. I did want to mention one thing, though, out of the Mezco visit. They were kind enough to give us they were kind enough to give us a figure uh, from their 112 collection. So if you're a Star Trek fan and you're listening to this, uh, keep it locked to Rageworks. We're going to be doing a contest to give that figure away to one lucky listener, viewer, or reader. So details for that will be available probably by this weekend. All right. So with that, housekeeping is out of the way. Let's jump into this week's MMA. Let's get to it, shall we? We had UFC Fight Night this past weekend, and it was the return of the Korean zombie to the octagon. Many people were excited, including yours truly. But UFC Fight Night 103 didn't just have... Um, a great return by the Korean Zombie, but it also had some really, really great fights, and I wanted to just share some of my favorites as well as some of the things that I enjoyed from the card. Uh, overall, the card was a great card for free TV. Um, we did have a couple of issues going into the fight card. Um, one was that uh, Beck Rawlings was supposed to be taking on Tessia Torres, and she had issue making weight. The fight, I believe, one could, was contested at a catch weight, I believe she was supposed to make 115. She was about 117, 118, and was just unable to cut weight. But Tessia Torres uh, definitely, you know, was a gamer. She went in there and she had a spectacular performance against Beck Rawlings. Uh, this opens up a lot of interesting scenarios. Uh, does Beck Rawlings go up and wait to fight in another weight class? Or does the UFC just, you know, kind of just let her let her figure out her, her weight cutting strategy and then try and give her another fight at 115. I felt that the fight overall was incredibly enjoyable. I felt that Tessia Torres definitely had one of her better performances. I always feel that she's always one fight away from getting a title opportunity. And um, it definitely showed in this fight. No disrespect to Beck Rawlings. I think Beck Rawlings is an awesome ambassador for the sport. She gives no fucks about anything. Uh, very open, very, you know, just wears her emotions on her sleeve she's a parent she goes out there she punches people in the face for a living and she shares her trials and tribulations on social media keeping it real as usual but um really really solid performance by tessia torres um i i really wanted beck rawlings to to win i know that she had trouble with the weight cut which was unfortunate but like i said the fight was really 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 good um chris gritzmacher and Chaz skelly uh gritzmacher was on the ultimate fighter I was kind of pulling for him on this one. I was a little bummed out to see Chaz Kelly, uh, Chaz Skelly, excuse me, dispatch him um, in the second round with a rear naked choke. Uh, Grutzmacher definitely was uh, not taken apart, but I felt that there was just a, a, a very, very, um, it just wasn't a stylistically good fight for him. I think Chaz Skelly, uh, on top of the fact that he was, uh, you know, taller and had longer reach. He really just used that reach advantage to pretty much pick apart uh, Chris Gritzmacher throughout the, that entire fight, which was unfortunate. Like I said, uh, in the second round, he used a, a more of the same to take the fight to the ground. And um, what ended up happening was that 
you know, Ske- when Gritzmacher in the, went for a body kick, Skelly tried for the double leg. And what ended up happening was he didn't get the double leg, but he ended up pushing Gritzmacher up against the fence. And then from there, he took him down. And at that point, it was just the, getting, you know, the, the hooks in and setting up the rear naked choke. Uh, really solid performance by Skelly. Uh, good stuff, definitely, from him. Um, Jessica Andrade was taking on the returning Angela Hill. Angela Hill, I'm a big fan of from the ultimate fighter also she's a gamer which is badass plus she always wears very awesome video game inspired outfits at the weigh-ins uh for the weigh-ins for this fight against jessica andrade she came in dressed as sagat uh with the eye patch and everything you guys gotta check that shit out because it was it was really cool um like i said i was pulling for angela hill she was the champion in invicta came over to the ufc uh took the fight on short notice and um you know, Jessica Andrade just really took the fight to her the, the, entire, the entire three rounds, securing a unanimous decision. But it was definitely rock'em, sock'em robots. Um, some people are even looking at this fight as, uh, you know, similar to Griffin and Bonner. And I definitely felt that there was, there, there was just a flurry of violence the entire time. I think both ladies left their all in the cage. And I was thoroughly, thoroughly, you know, thoroughly impressed with Jessica Andrade, who is no slouch and of course Angela Hill is not is definitely no slouch she comes in there and she definitely is a beautiful conductor when it comes to the symphony of violence and um it was a really good fight do yourselves a favor and check that fight out if you can highlights for that are on YouTube and man were they were they really really solid both ladies um OSP was back in the cage taking on Volcan OS De- I'm going to mess up this guy's name OS Demir uh, which is probably the wrong pronunciation. I had OSP in this fight, but um, Oez Demir definitely just was a bit more aggressive. He he utilized uh, really great striking to really put OSP on the defensive a lot of the time. Um, you know, he definitely had some of the better exchanges in the close. You know, in the close exchanges in the in the tie in the clinches. Um, I also felt that he was just able to bring more to the table consistently over the three rounds i'm bummed though because i like osp uh dude is no joke and um you know hopefully we'll see him back there sooner rather than later uh abel trujillo and james vicks fight is another fight that could have gone either way i kind of was leaning towards abel trujillo for that fight but james vick was having none of it he secured uh his victory with a beautiful darce choke in the third round which was just it was it was beautiful. It really was. I was thoroughly impressed uh, with the way that Darce choke was put together, and it was just amazing technique by James Vick. Uh, we saw Felice Herrick back in the octagon, another Ultimate Fighter competitor, also known for her you know social media presence. Uh, Felice Herrick, no slouch, uh, really good kickboxing, uh, taking on Alexa Grazo. Uh, this fight was interesting. They ended up. Uh, mixing it up, especially in that first round, Grasso definitely had some of the better exchanges, but Herrick dialed, dialed it in in the second, and um, the third could have gone either way. I watched it twice, you know, once live and then once on DVR, and I kind of felt that it could have gone to Grasso, but it could have gone to Felice Herrick. Um, really wasn't a fan of how the judges saw it, but it was definitely close. I will say that if you watch that fight and you run it back, you probably will you know, you're probably going to see it go either way like I did, but who knows? I think, um, you know, Felice Herrig is one of those fighters that if she can string a couple of wins together, she definitely has title, oppor- you know, she definitely has the tools to get into title contention and an opportunity like that uh, with someone who is so well-versed and just making, you know, making herself visible to the public eye. I think it, it would be interesting for sure. And this has nothing to do with the fact that, you know, whether she's scantily clad or not, I'm just talking about in the since the UFC is in star making mode, you might as well leverage the fighters that know how to access all the tools in their arsenal. I think Herrick definitely does a good job of that. Um, and again, I also feel that she has enough of a well-rounded skill set to to really do what she's got to do. But again, uh, if you watch that fight, like I said, you're going to view it and you may think that it went one way or the other based on repeated viewings that's why sometimes maybe i watch a fight twice just to see if i wasn't sure about it to to discuss it with you guys but this fight was definitely one where if you watched it you could have you could have given it to either one of these ladies that's for sure 
Your main event saw the return of the Korean Zombie taking on Dennis Bermudez, host of Cooking with the Menace, uh, which if you follow him on Snapchat or the UFC Snapchat channel, you'll see that Dennis Bermudez is a, he's a fun dude, man. He, he, he has a really, really good time, not only with the fans, but just putting out content. And I was really bummed to root against him just because, like I said, I, I like Dennis Bermudez. Uh, the Korean Zombie came in... Um, you know, six six inch reach advantage. He was an inch taller than Bermudez. I knew this was how it was gonna go, but I was thoroughly surprised not only by the performance that Chan Sung Jung put on, but also by the crowd response. Really, a lot of a lot of people were were in the Korean Zombies corner, and um, it was it was beautiful stuff, man. He he had great, you know, just great takedown defense. His striking game was crisp. Um, and the crazy thing was, you know, he took off, he's been off for a few years, obviously serving, serving for serving the military for his country and to see him come back and just be crisp and solid and have, you know, just beautiful, beautiful technique. It shows you that, you know, some guys just really are talented when it comes to this sport and the Korean zombie is definitely one of them. This is another guy that. He's marketable. The crowd is into him. You know that he has a cool fighting name. His T-shirts are always fucking awesome. Um, the UFC would be would be stupid to not leverage this to obviously establish a bigger footprint in areas like you know Korea and Asia in general uh, with guys like the Korean Zombie as you know the ambassadors for the sport. But it was a, a good fight. Good to see him back in there. Uh, he won the fight via knockout in the first round. Beautiful uh, Street Fighter style uppercut to take out Dennis, uh, Dennis Bermudez, who was unconscious as soon as he hit the, the mat. It was it was a wrap. Uh, really, really stellar performance. And like I said, a beautiful, beautiful uppercut to close things out. Welcome back, Korean Zombie. We've missed you. All right. So. In terms of the other MMA news for the week, there were some some of the usual stuff. First of all, bonuses for Fight Night. Uh, Korean Zombie got one. Uh, Marcel Fortuna got one for performance. And Fight of the Night went to Jessica Andrade and Angela Hill, which um, I got no problem with that whatsoever. I thought that it was um, it it was well fucking deserved. That's for sure. Um, of course, it wouldn't be a week of MMA news without Conor McGregor. Uh, in the news once again this week, this time pointing pointing his uh, his verbal jabs at Anderson Silva. Uh, it was interesting because he did a in an in an interview recently with MMA Junkie. He was asked about possibly fighting Anderson Silva, which was which was pretty crazy. And he said, you know, Anderson Silva said, you know, I have a lot of respect for Conor McGregor because this man changed everything in the UFC. I'm very respectful of Conor McGregor's style, and I think it's a great challenge for my martial arts technique. I don't talk to disrespect Connor. It's just a challenge for myself and for the best stand-up fighting. I respect Connor, and I think this would be a great show, a great fight for the rest of my life and the rest of my story in the UFC. Uh, first off, if that fight were to happen, it would be fucking bananas. Second of all, I applaud Anderson Silva for his usual just just approaching the fight game, you know, in a in a in a classy, tasteful manner. We we know Anderson Silva is not where he was, you know, at his prime. But Anderson Silva still puts asses in seats and still has amazing, amazing technique. Plus, he still has something to prove and something to bring to the table for the sport of MMA. And I think that even though, obviously, everybody wants to fight Conor McGregor, you also have to look at the opportunity that this creates for, for a guy like Conor McGregor and for Anderson Silva. Obviously, the big payday is not to be denied, but we're also talking about the fact that there's legacy here. And that's something that I think Anderson Silva is really focusing on as his career begins to wind down. He wants to have amazing fights, memorable fights, and fights that people will talk about forever. And I think that, you know, he's going to have some bumps in the road. Obviously, he's going to be facing Derek Brunson this weekend, and I'll get into that in my fight picks. But, you know, Anderson Silva, when we talk about pound for pound, top 10 fighters on the planet, Anderson Silva has to be in that list at all times just because of what this guy did and the run that he had in the sport of MMA. I mean, you know, his run and, and the fact that he had those amazing matches with Chael, the stuff with, with Weidman and everything else along the way, the, the guy was one of the most dominant fighters. I mean, he you know, he dismantled Rich Franklin. Um, 
you know, and that his fight with Forrest Griffin was tremendous. And this is what I'm talking about. You look at this guy and you say to yourself, this this guy is definitely one of the pound for pound best guys on the planet. And of course, McGregor, everybody, like I said, it's it's a it's a it's a it's a lotto ticket. It's a scratch off lotto ticket. And um, of course, you know, they asked McGregor about it. And he's like, fuck every one of them. You see, Anderson, what's Anderson talking about? What the fuck is Anderson Silva talking about? He keeps mentioning my name over and over again. Look. I'll fight any one of them. Make sure the numbers are right. Make sure the situation is right. I'll fight any one of them at any given time. And the thing is that, you know, McGregor is always going to be McGregor. Anybody expecting something less or something less brash, less cocky, and less over the top has not been watching mixed martial arts for as long as, as, we, as most of us have, you know, that are, that are longtime fans. Conor McGregor is not stupid. He is... And in the driver's seat, which I, I, I've said it before and I'll say it again, you know, the UFC created this monster and they can't they can't contain him. And because of that, Conor McGregor essentially can pretty much make the rules at this point. You know, the big money fights, the pay-per-views, unless somebody beats his ass on a consistent basis. And I'm not talking about a one and done where he loses, comes back and wins. But I'm talking where he loses two fights, maybe three fights. You know, and people look at him a little differently, like they like they did with Ronda. Then that's when then the when the situation changes. But right now, McGregor is in the driver's seat because, like I said, you know, his the UFC's debut at MSG was historic. Um, first guy to win two belts in two divisions and actively, and it, it was like I said, historic. And for that alone, and the fact that he is such a huge draw, the UFC is. In a, in a really sticky situation, I've I've said it before. It's like they go, they built this guy up. That you know, Dana White, the Fertitas, letting him stay at the suites and paying for this and buying him this and doing this. You know, you ended up just feeding the monster, and now that you've fed the monster to the point where he's too big to control, you don't know what to do with him. Every time Conor McGregor's in the news, and I talk about him on our MMA segment, it's always him talking shit, him saying fuck the UFC, poking fights with the WWE. To set something up there, the Mayweather thing, you know, him vacating belts, him defending belts, him fighting this guy, him fighting that guy. And it's it's really unfortunate because, again, you know, McGregor brings something to the table that is lacking in the sport. And that is a glorified star who also can become a very, very, very polarizing villain. And that's the thing, like people either want to see him fight because they love the guy or they want to see the guy the guy get punched in the face because they hate his fucking guts and it's a it's a it's a very very interesting situation for the sport but um with regards to McGregor I'm going to be honest we're not going to see him till after um his fiance has the baby and even after that happens it'll probably be 3 to 4 months before he gets back in there if we see Connor in the cage it'll probably be it'll probably be fall 2017 at the latest um, I doubt we're going to see him earlier than that unless something magical happens where like this Mayweather thing can come together. But I don't foresee, I honestly don't see McGregor in there until uh, the fall of 2017 at, at, at the earliest. Um, the one thing I will say, though, is that he is champ. And because of that, uh, I'd put, again, the UFC is in a precarious situation because now you, you stripped him of one belt which you gave to Jose Aldo, now he's your lightweight champion, what now? Obviously, we know that, uh, you know, Khabib is is trying to get an opportunity and they're fighting for an interim belt, but the money fight is the McGregor fight, and like I said, I don't think we'll be seeing him until, you know, the, 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 the tail end of 2017, but who knows? Maybe they'll dangle the right carrot with the right amount of zeros, and maybe we'll see him back in there, but I just genuinely don't see it happening, and I'll be honest, all the speculation, this guy wants to fight him, that guy wants to fight him, this thing, that thing. At the end of the day, if there's no name on no contract and nobody and there's no number and McGregor himself is not saying, hey, I'm coming back, it's all, it's all you know, speculation and, and hype. That's all it is. But the Anderson Silva thing, I wanted to mention it because it was interesting. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd genuinely want to see that just because it's like one, you have one of the best on the planet fighting, you know, a guy who's considered the... the the leader of the new generation when it comes to the UFC. So it, it's, you know, it's, it's fantasy booking out of curiosity though. If Anderson Silva did fight Conor McGregor, who would win? I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I think I'm also going to throw that maybe in the group as well. All right. So 
let's move on to some other news. We got a brand new main event set up for UFC 211 as Stipe Miocic defends his heavyweight title against Junior Dos Santos. UFC 211 will be going down in May. Uh, Fabricio Verdum will be taking on Ben Rothwell on that card, and I have a feeling that will be a title eliminator. I'm actually looking forward to seeing Stipe and Junior Dos Santos mix it up. Stipe, of course, is, is, a, is, an, is a beast, and uh, JDS is just trying to get, get back in there, get back on the horse, so to speak. Both guys have amazing knockout power, and I think that this fight is going to end violently and very, very early. Again, mark it down on your calendars, May 13th for UFC 211. But before we get to that, of course, we got to talk about UFC 208, which is this weekend at the Barclays Center here in New York City. Our main event, Holly Holm, Jermaine Durandamy for the inaugural women's featherweight title. Anderson Silva will be taking on Derek Brunson. Tim Bosch, Ronaldo, Jacare Souza, Glover Teixeira is taking on Jared Cannonier. Uh, Jim Miller is taking on Dustin Poirier. That's on the main card, which is pay-per-view, 10 p.m. Eastern. Prelims, uh, Jared Brooks, Ian McCall, Nick Lentz, uh, Islam Makshevov, which I'm probably killing that guy's name, uh, Wilson Rice, Ulka Sasaki, and Randy Brown taking on Bilal Muhammad. Um, I'm going to give you guys predictions for the main card only because a lot of the guys on the prelims, I haven't seen them fight, and what I have seen is just not enough to give you guys an honest prediction. So, uh, with regards to the main card, we'll start with the opener, Jim Miller, Dustin Poirier. I'm a big Jim Miller fan, and I like Dustin Poirier. He's, a, he's, a, he's an exciting fighter to watch, but I'm going to go with Jim Miller on this one. I really, like I said, I enjoy watching Miller fight, and I think that this fight is going to go uh, in Jim Miller's favor. Will it put him back in title contention? I cannot tell you. Uh, Jared Cannonier and, and Glover Teixeira. I like Glover Teixeira. I think that, you know, he's a solid, a solid fighter, has great, poten- great, great knockout power. Um, but, you know, Jared Cannonier is, you know, is an interesting guy. And I think I've only seen him fight once. So it would be, again, a disservice to, to both guys with this to, to give you guys a prediction that without obviously doing my homework. But I am going to go with Glover Teixeira just because the guy has ample experience in the cage and i think that when it, you know the big fights come up he definitely dials it in now tim bosch and jacques ray souza are is a fight that i if, if tim bosch was fighting anybody else i'd probably say yeah he's you know he definitely has a shot but jacques ray's on a tear he wants the title opportunity and um obviously we know yo romero is facing michael bisping but jacques ray's in the hunt man and i think that because of that and he's going to be super motivated. And I, and you know, as much as I like Tim Bosch, I, uh, I don't see this fight going in his favor. So I'm, I'm, th- I'm saying, uh, Jacare will be taking uh, that fight. Now, in terms of Brunson, Derek Brunson, Anderson Silva, I, I would be, I'd be lying if I didn't say that there's always the potential for upset with Anderson Silva because if he comes in too cocky, he can get caught. But I also feel that Anderson Silva's kind of, you know, the losses have matured him. He's battle hardened. And um, I think Brunson is going to help him put on an amazing show, but I think Anderson Silva is definitely going to walk away the victor in that fight. Now, obviously, the women's match, we will be crowning the crowning an inaugural women's featherweight champion. Of course, um, Amanda Nunes has said that she would love to be uh, the first wi- the first female two division champion. So who knows? Maybe maybe the winner will face her. Um, I like Jermaine Durand, Amy. She's no joke. Really, really, really no joke. I just feel that Holly Holm has a more well-rounded toolbox uh, in terms of striking. Um, you know, the Rousey fight was proof of that. Obviously, the from a wrestling perspective, we know Misha Tate kind of exposed the weakness there. But I also feel that Holly Holm is going to go out there and try and give it 110%. Obviously, this is a big stage with the ladies main eventing and also crowning the first women's featherweight the first women's featherweight champion plus this was all set up with the with the expectation that cyborg would be in in a slot here so if i were if i were being honest i would like to say that holly home is going to take this just because i feel like i said holly home is well-rounded but i know that the fight can go either way and it would be a disservice to write off jermaine durandami uh and not give her her props because definitely she is very very dangerous but i am going to go with holly home on this one to become the first women's featherweight champion. And I do feel that it is inevitable when Cyborg 
gets past her her wellness issues that Cyborg is going to be in that in that title picture for sure. And, you know, who knows? Maybe Ronda will go up in weight and fight at featherweight. We'll see what happens. Maybe she'll try her luck in that division if she comes back at all. We shall see what happens. All right. So with those predictions, that is going to close out the MMA segment for this week. Let us switch gears and jump into some wrestling. Yes, sir, we promised you a great main event here tonight. All right, let's jump right into it with this week's Raw, which was actually, when it comes down to uh, WWE's programming, was probably the leader this week. Uh, we had some good angle advancement. We had some great buildup. We had Samoa Joe, which I'll get into in a moment. Plus, we had some stellar, stellar cruiserweight stuff, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Um, as I said, we, we got Samoa Joe's official contract signing this week. Uh, great promo work between him and... And uh, McFoley also, they used that opportunity to set up a match with him and Roman Reigns, uh, throwing him into the deep water immediately. Obviously, the exchange between him and Roman got the crowd incredibly hype. Uh, I thought this was a great opportunity, not just because you get Samoa Joe in the deep water, but as much as I, you know, as much as like I've always said, people give Roman Reigns shit. I think that putting Roman Reigns in there with performers that are better than him just make him a better wrestler all around. And I think putting him in there with Joe is proof of that. Uh, in terms of Seth Rollins, we know that Seth Rollins is on the shelf. Uh, it's been it's been reported by various outlets that he tore his MCL. Um, but it appears that he may still be a go for WrestleMania, which is which is pretty crazy. And um, you know, we we'll be watching that very very closely as the week rolls on. Now, in terms of the matches that we had, we had a Braun Strowman squash match, which obviously was ridiculous, but was the catalyst to build Braun Strowman and Roman Reigns for Fastlane, which, whatever, I don't have a problem with that. Uh, Nia Jax killed Bailey dead. Um, obviously, we had we had some some interference from Charlotte, but I also felt that that Bailey and Jax have the 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 capability of putting on a really 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 good match and. Um, I, I get you know I get why it went the way it did because obviously you gotta you gotta make Nia Jax look strong obviously being the dominant force in your women's division but in in wins and losses Bailey Bailey didn't need to eat that pin and lose that it just it just bummed me out because like I, like I've said before Bailey has this huge wave of momentum the crowds into her little girls love her and to just have her lose in a match that for all intents and purposes did nothing except possibly strengthen the the motivation for a possible Sasha Banks heel turn there was nothing that it accomplished for either performer that that made Bailey's loss necessary now you know we we had uh, Akira Tozawa show up on Raw I I definitely marked out big fan of Tozawa loved what he did in a Cruiserweight Classic putting him in there with Drew Gulak isn't a bad isn't a bad thing either um I'm bummed, though, because I just don't feel that they're letting Gulak win matches. I kind of feel that he's just a, a technician that's in there to make the other guys look good, which is unfortunate. And it's not even because, you know, Drew Gulak's been been on the show before and and I'm a fan of his, but just because he brings that that gritty technical expertise to the table and WWE is not utilizing that. I get, you know, you want to make Tozawa look good and that's fine. But I also feel that Gulak, Lince Dorado, these are guys that you can do stuff with where they can be more meaningful additions to the cruiserweights. And on top of that, and this is something that, that I've said before, just because they're competing in the cruiserweight division doesn't mean that they can't have feuds and matches with some of the other guys. Like, that's the thing that bothers me. Like, why couldn't a guy like Drew Gulak go out there and have a match with Sami Zayn, for instance? Why? Just because he's a cruiserweight? That was the thing, you know, one of the things that I like about TNA with, let's say, the X Division. It's like, yeah, the X Division competes against each other, but the X Division is about no limits, and they go and they compete against other guys. And, you know, the X Division champion can turn in his title to a challenge for the World Heavyweight title, et cetera, et cetera. Those are the things that are that are important. And it's one of the things that I feel WWE is trying too hard to do. Like, they're segregating it too much. Like, I get it. 
You know, 205 Live, the cruiserweights, they're, they're there. And, you know, they're there to, to, to bolster that division. And that's fine. But I also feel that guys like Drew Gulak could benefit from being in the mid card and mixing it up and doing stuff there. Again, we're not saying go and put him in a, in a world heavyweight title match or a universal title match, but utilize these guys outside of the, the, the confines of 205 Live because they can bring a lot more to the table. That's all I'm saying. Gallows and Anderson took on Sheamus and Cesaro. Uh, interesting how that match went as it ended in DQ because of Enzo and Big Cass sitting ringside. Um, I just felt that that was such a weird setup with Enzo and Cass just out there. I get what you're trying to do, you know, with the tag team division. And it's, it's inevitable that Enzo and Big Cass will be tag team champions. Don't, don't be shocked if, it do, if, it's, if it's something that doesn't happen by WrestleMania or by SummerSlam, the latest, but Enzo and Kaz will get a title run. I'm telling you. Uh, the New Day took on the Shining Stars for no reason whatsoever, except to possibly tease some New Day ice cream, maybe some Bootios ice cream, maybe some ice cream bars, um, which is cool, man. I, I definitely want to give props to WWE and for what they're doing with the New Day, because when the New Day originally started, we all know that they were fucking terrible. And then they just they just hit the ground running and they ended up creating something unique and, you know, no pun intended, magical with the fans. These guys come out, they, they interact with the fans on a spectacular level from giving out cereal to throwing merchandise in the stands. The kids love it. Uh, they got cool catchphrases and they're just exciting performers to see out there every week, whether it's chopping it up on the mic or delivering in the ring. Uh, the New Day never, ever disappoints. I just feel bad that the Shining Stars just, they're, they're trapped in a shitty gimmick. Those are two guys that I would probably, if they make the weight re requirements, I would put in the Cruiserweight in the cruiserweight division. I'm being honest. Primo and Epico in the Cruiserweight division would be good because it would allow them to utilize um, a lot of that moveset that they've pretty much never used uh, during their, their tag team and singles run. That's all I'm saying. We had a U.S. title match with Sami Zayn and Chris Jericho, which was really, really good. Um, it was interesting also because we saw we saw Goldberg and um, Kevin Owens essentially get set up, and it was um, it was it was good. You know, I, I think um, that this is going to be the the straw that breaks the camel's back because Chris Jericho pretty much put Kevin Owens in that match. Um, you know, it's it's crazy because you know. We've been we've been watching the slow burn of of Jericho Jericho um, over the last couple of months, and we know that it's inevitable. And I think that this is going to be the 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 instance where Goldberg beats Kevin Owens. Kevin Owens goes crazy, attacks Chris Jericho, uh, maybe Jericho and Owens at Mania for the U.S. title. And um, you know, a lot of people a lot of people are are concerned, and and I'm one of them. Obviously, Goldberg going out there with a guy like Kevin Owens, who is incredibly well-rounded, incredibly fast, and just a more technical performer versus Goldberg, who goes out there and has two-and-a-half-minute squash matches for the bulk of his career. I, I'm concerned, but I also understand the necessity to, to put Goldberg in that position because I think him and Lesnar uh, with the belt has a lot more at stake. Again, I'm bummed because I, I love Kevin Owens, and I think Kevin Owens is a tremendous performer, and... Um, I think that that's going to be the problem with 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 this match overall. That the crowd is going to be torn in their love for Kevin Owens as a performer, but the fact that Goldberg is the means to an end and is you know the crowd the crowd's into him, man. The guy that's one thing you know everybody's been really shocked about it, but that's that's something that Goldberg's always done well. He comes out the intensity, the way they've presented the character to to the fans nowadays. It's you know, it's very endearing. They've done a good job. You know, his kid and his wife out there, they know what they're doing in terms of that and in terms of just leveraging that for, for the crowd response. And, and they're doing a great job. Like I said, is it a, am I bummed that it's at the expense of Kevin Owens? Absolutely. But unless something crazy happens, I wouldn't be shocked for Goldberg to walk out of Fastlane, uh, your new WWE Universal Champion. And then obviously we got a bigger, we got a bigger, we got bigger stakes with Goldberg and Lesnar. We had an amazing, amazing cruiserweight match with um, Jack Gallagher, TJ, Cedric Alexander taking on Neville, Tony Nese, and Noam Dar. What a fucking tremendous match. I really, really enjoyed it. I thought that we got to see not only some really great things, but um, 
we also got to see just a, an opportunity for the cruiserweights to do what they had to do. And I love the fact that they used Austin Aries as the catalyst for this because, you know, Austin Aries, we know that it's inevitable that he's going to make a splash in the cruiserweight division. And I'll get into that later on in the segment. But um, I thought they did a great job and, you know, they did a good job building towards 205 Live, which was fine. And um, it was good, man. The match, I loved it. I love that we got to see some great moves from 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 all the performers there. It was it was solid, man. It was really, really solid. Um you know, obviously, the build for this is what the match that's going down on 205 Live, which I'll um I'll get into when we talk about that show. But overall, I thought I thought the cruiserweights and and again I say it every week, having them on Raw and and taping 205 Live with a Raw crowd, the cruiserweights on Raw is one thing as a special attraction, but having them on 205 Live, I mean, um, re- recording 205 Live with Raw, I'm I'm just not a fan. We got an Emelina promo. She's coming next week. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe who gives a shit? <laughs> we'll see. Um, Roman Reigns and Samoa Joe was about as, as ac- not academic, but as exciting as you would expect. Roman Reigns comes out, makes his little entrance. Joe proceeds to just come out, no music, and beat the holy fuck out of Roman Reigns, which was good. Um, Braun Strowman was there and got involved, which I knew was going to happen. It was a good way to not hurt Roman Reigns momentum, but also not make Samoa Joe look like a punk, which was good. Um, it was it, it it really was a great match, and obviously all the stuff with Braun Strowman building towards their you know Reigns and and Strowman at Fastlane was the right thing to do. Uh, but overall, the match itself was good, man, and that's another thing I gotta say. You know, Roman Reigns, he and like I said before, you put him in there with a good opponent, he's gonna give it his all, and Samoa Joe. Samoa Joe brought the pain, man. He was working, you know, the, the the stiff style that he usually works. And Roman Reigns took the damage, man. He made it look good. He made it look believable. The spots were crisp. And having Braun come out there, like I said, the involvement of that, was the you know, his involvement was the means to an end. And it didn't hurt the match because it was necessary for the, the narrative that they're setting up with Reigns and Braun Strowman for Fastlane. So Raw this week was pretty damn good now with regards to to smackdown smackdown of course we know is building towards the elimination chamber which is this weekend and of course you know we got to see all the all the competitors from the from the card in in different matches baron corbin taking on uh the miz and dean ambrose and aj styles it was you know a nice little uh fatal four-way match good match i felt that it was good i was really impressed with the miz's mic work uh, when he came out to kind of set this match up by beefing with Daniel Bryan, I would give anything to see Daniel Bryan one more time in the ring, just once, man, one more time, just because you know you see you see the Miz out there talking shit, and and the you know Daniel Bryan knows the exact things to say to really fuck with the Miz, and it was just really good to see. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, we had another paint by numbers match with Apollo Cruz and Dolph Ziggler. We get it; he's a heel, and Kalisto came in for the save. Uh, we also had a um, a tag team, uh, pretty much a, uh, I guess an eight-man tag is what you want to call it. Yeah, I guess, yeah, it was an eight-man tag match. Vaude Villains, the Usos, and the Ascension took on American Alpha, Slater, and Rhino, and uh, the Fashion Police. Uh, obviously, this is the buildup for the match on Sunday. It was okay. Uh, obviously, looking at the participants in this match, it's very easy to see two teams out of that ma- out of that match, either... American Alpha retaining or the Usos getting the belts back, but we'll get into that in a moment. The match was paint by numbers for a tag team match. You know, it is what it is. Uh, We had a non-title match with Cena and Orton, which was really good. Great storytelling there with Bray Wyatt getting involved and Luke Harper getting involved and John Cena coming away with the pinfall. But there was really, really good stuff there. Um, Like I said, for for the final show for the pay-per-view, it was it was meh. It was it was all right. A um, couple of standout things I do want to say. Baron Corbin has impressed over the last couple of weeks. Definitely getting really good. Uh, he's pushing it. He's getting he's getting better and better every week. His mic work is getting solid. His hairline is getting thinner, but that's besides the point. Um, Corbin looked good, man, and I think him walking out uh, the victor in this match makes it very, very interesting when it comes to the chamber, which I'll give my prediction later on. Uh, we had a... a uh, I don't even want to. I don't even know what to call this. I guess it's an interview with Nikki Bella and Natalia, which was completely fucking crazy and stupid. Plus, 
Natalia looked like she had a like her face was made out of play doh. Uh, not a not a fan. Um, you know, it was it was just it was it was terrible. Uh, we had a contract signing with Alexa Bliss and uh, Mickey James doing their contract signing for their matches at the pay per view, which Alexa Bliss, of course, has a date with Naomi and Mickey James has a date with Becky Lynch. Overall, they did a good sell there. Naomi definitely impresses. I would love to see Naomi get the title. I think she's due, and she's incredibly over. Awesome entrance. Uh, great ring work. She's continuing to improve every week, and um, we'll see what happens, man. I definitely feel that, you know, SmackDown for for something that's building, that that's impacting WrestleMania so greatly as the Elimination Chamber, it could have been a little bit better this week. It was rather paint-by-numbers. Now... On the flip side, 205 Live was fucking awesome. I was bummed because at the start of the show, they had announced that Tony Nese got injured uh, during his match on Raw, so Nice was out of the Fatal 5-Way match. But what was, what was good was that they did a match to set up for a new participant to be added to the match <clears throat> based on who won the, the opener, which had Mustafa Ali taking on Arya Davari. And um, I like what they're doing. I like that they're building Mustafa Ali. They're doing a really good job with the invor- with the inverted 450, which was just beautiful. Uh, Arya Davari's all right, man. He's he's not great. And, you know, as much as people think that he's this this awesome guy, he's not great. He's a good hand. I don't want to say he's a good hand because that's kind of cliched to say. But he's um he's a he's a complete wrestler. You know, he knows how to turn up the villainy. He knows how to have that WWE style move set, which obviously, you know, he did his homework and it was good. I, I felt that it was a good way to help Mustafa Ali get over, which was great. But um it was a very formulaic match to open things up, but it gets Ali into the uh, number one contenders elimination match. Uh we got a video package for Grand Metalik, who's debuting next week. Very excited about that. Uh Lince Dorado and Brian Kendrick was pretty pretty decent, you know. Uh Lince Dorado is I'm a big fan, and um, as I've said before, I think that you definitely got to not have these guys become fodder every week. In other words, they come out, depending on who they're taking on, you almost know it's a guaranteed loss. Not that Brian Kendrick you know, needs the victory or doesn't, but it's just the fact that I knew as soon as Kendrick came out that the music was going to be, uh, as soon as Brian Kendrick came out, I said, all right, Dorado, Dorado's losing. And, and I was bummed just because, like I said, I like Dorado. I think that, you know, him being a masked performer is, is definitely good from a merchandising perspective. Kids love the masks, and you should be doing more with that. Instead, you know, he's just a, a sacrificial lamb. Uh, it was good, though, because post, post-match, post uh, Austin Aries and his, his amazing interviews interviewed Brian Kendrick, saw the return of Tajiri, who ended up misting Brian Kendrick, which was dope. Uh, Neville, of course, being typical angry, uh, happy meal size version of Wade Barrett. It was it was a good match though. That number one contenders match: TJ, Noam Dar, Jack Gallagher, Cedric Alexander, Mustafa Ali. It was it was legitimately a holy shit moment from bell to bell. I mean, we saw one man Spanish fly from Cedric Alexander, which was fucking insane. I was like, holy cow. Um, you know, some some little comedy spots by Jack Gallagher, which was dope. Um, everybody everybody played their part to a T. I was bummed not to see Tony Nice in there. And it makes me wonder if the at at you know the entire time if Jack Gallagher was though going to be the winner of this match and they weren't gonna set up maybe Tony Nice as as the victor. Not to say that TJ Perkins didn't have a chance and neither did Noam Dar, but I'm curious as to why they didn't go with uh, Cedric Alexander who has a huge wave of momentum going in and went with the uh, with the odd duck, so to speak, in Jack Gallagher. Again, I'm a big Jack Gallagher fan. I've I've you know I've talked about how awesome I think he is since he burst on the scene during 205 Live. But um, a couple of things, you know, I like you know we know that that Noam Dar and Cedric are are in there in the midst of their feud, which is fine. Uh, TJ TJ Perkins is um, I don't know, man. I kind of feel that that. He he may go to the dark side sooner rather than later, just because of the way that he's been booked lately. You know, super cocky, super arrogant. Wouldn't be shocked if it happens sooner rather than later. But overall, uh, really, really good episode of Two Hundred Five Live. I I I'd be 
you know, lying if I didn't say that I felt 205 Live was better than the SmackDown that was supposed to build for the Elimination Chamber, which is fucking insane. But that is genuinely the case. It pains me to admit it. But nonetheless, uh, 205 Live and Raw definitely the standout in terms of Raw and SmackDown. But 205 Live just a better product in terms of some of the wrestling we saw this week. All right. Let's talk wrestling news. Uh, Finn Balor, who many were hoping would be a surprise participant in the Rumble, unfortunately we know was not. But in a new update, it appears that he may be back for WrestleMania in some capacity. We don't know if it's him performing at WrestleMania, maybe winning the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal, but we will see the Demon at WrestleMania. He sustained a horrible, horrible injury during the... uh, the, um, the match with Seth Rollins, he had a labrum tear, um, which is terrible. You know, I, I've, I've suffered uh, an injury to my labrum, which is in your shoulder, and it's, it's bad. You, you pretty much can't, can't do anything. You can't even, you can't even pick up uh, you know, a bag of potatoes without being in excruciating pain. Plus, your, your arm just gets weak. Uh, so he suffered a lot you know, between the labrum tear. They said he had a bicep tear and a couple of other injuries in there. So he's coming back from a ton of stuff. So to see to see him back by Mania would be cool, but I genuinely would not rush it just because Balor's the guy that you want to have in there for the long haul, and you don't want to rush him back right away. As I mentioned a couple of weeks back, we know that WWE's UK tournament was met with, for all intents and purposes, positive, you know, positive feedback. Uh, it looks like they are they really are going to move forward with doing other tournaments in other international regions. Uh, the Wrestling Observer has said that WWE may move forward to crown their first ever WWE Asia champion, uh, which is going to be very, very interesting. And it's something I talked about a couple of weeks back when I said that, you know, the UK title, the UK title was something that was done. And it wasn't just done to showcase the European talent, but it was a way to let to let other promotions know that hey wwe is establishing their own territories and you would be smart to step your game up because they're going to come in and they're going to take they're going to take that spot from you in your own hood so definitely interested to see what they do with the uh, wwe asia tournament we'll see what happens once we get more news with that of course i will let you guys know I was bummed to hear that uh, from PW Insider that Kevin Kelly is no longer going to be the voice of Ring of Honor. Uh, Kevin Kelly, as many of you know, had many memorable segments with The Rock, went on to work with Ring of Honor in 2010, and um, he gave his notice and left the company, I believe it was last week or the week prior. He had, he had been working in Ring of Honor's front office, and he was doing that and the announcing duties as well. Uh, Pretty big blow for Ring of Honor, in my opinion. I mean, you know, you lose, uh, uh, you know, you lose uh, Nigel McGuinness now, Kevin Kelly. It's it's crazy. Plus, you lose, um, oh man, Steve Carino. Also, it's just it's just really a big blow to Ring of Honor. Uh, pretty much everybody's saying that Ian Riccoboni, who does a lot of the announcing for Women of Honor, may, may be stepping in for Kelly's replacement, but we have yet to see if that is the case. All right. On the Lucha Libre side of things, you know, we talked about uh, Pentagon's recent name change uh, becoming Penta Ohm or Penta Zero M, which is Penta Cero Miedo. And um, the reason for that, obviously, is because Pentagon Jr. left AAA and he was working on the independence. He had to change his name from Pentagon Jr. to this new Penta OM or Penta Zero M, depending on how you want to read it. Uh, because obviously Pen- the name Pentagon Jr. is owned by AAA. But the interesting thing is, if you guys saw on Rageworks, we published that, Do- that Dorian Rodan is now uh, the head of Lucha Libre FMV, which are the owners of Lucha Underground. And the crazy thing is that Lucha Libre FMV has applied to trademark Penta Zero M to obviously uh, get the trademark so that they can have Pentagon's new name and stop him from using it, which is pretty, you know, it's pretty dirt, you know, it's dirty pool in my opinion. Listen, we know the guy uh, cut his teeth as Pentagon Jr. You guys own that name. That's the name everyone knows. It's the name that sells. We got it. We know that Lucha Underground has Pentagon Dark. We know that they've got that covered. But really, you're going to go and try and take away this name that this guy came up with, even though it was a name that he announced after he left your promotion. It's, it's crazy. 
It really is crazy. I'm shocked that they didn't try to, um, you know, do Cero Miedo also as a, uh, as a trademark. I am genuinely shocked that that did not happen. But nonetheless, I'm going to be watching this story very closely because, you know, the Lucha Libre FMV, being the, the, the owners of Lucha Underground, they're, they're really hurting their talent by doing stuff like this because, like I said, Pentagon was a big part of, of Lucha Underground was super over, super popular. And yeah, you know, he went off on his own, but you're you're cutting off your nose to spite your face. Why? To own a name that you're not going to do shit with? To keep the guy from, you know, making money on, on the independence? He's not hurting anybody. On the contrary, him working the independence and not doing TV when, you know, Lucha Underground gave him so much exposure is hurting him more than it's genuinely hurting you. I, you know, I'd love to, to talk to Dorian Rodan and see what he has to say about that. I mean, I'd be curious to see what, is, what, are the, what are the motivations for something like that, for a play like that. Because like I said, you're not... Pentagon Jr. on the independence is making money. Yes, he's making probably more than he's making working for, for some of these smaller promotions. But he's not hurting. He's not taking money out of the promotion's pocket. He's just not signed with you. It's no different than Cody Rhodes. Cody left WWE. You know, WWE owns, I guess, the Rhodes name, but he went out there and he performed as Cody. That did, you know, they could have gone out there and gone after him for Cody, but at that point, it's like, for what? And don't get me wrong. I know that when he was on Impact Wrestling, they were smart by, you know, saying Brandy and Cody Rhodes because that way they would still kind of get, they would get past and get around, uh, you know, Cody Rhodes' inability to use the Rhodes' last name on TNA, on, you know, on Impact Wrestling. But that doesn't, you know, again, yes, is it something that you want to protect and you want to do something with? Sure, but what money are you going to make? What money are you going to make with Penta Zero M or Penta OM that you weren't making with Pentagon Jr. or Pentagon Dark? I kind of feel it's ridiculous. That's all I'm saying. All right, so we already know that a couple of cards have been finalized. We know that Fastlane is taking shape with Kevin Owens putting his title up against Goldberg. Uh, Neville is going to be facing Jack Gallagher, Roman Reigns, and Braun Strowman. And, of course, we also know that Goldberg will be facing Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania 33, which um, may be for the title. So uh, we'll be watching that very, very closely. And, of course, on the SmackDown side of things, uh, Randy Orton awaits the winner of the Chamber, which, of course, that event goes down this Sunday. WrestleMania is April 2nd. On the, injury, on the injury report, we know that Tony Nese was pulled because of the heel injury he suffered on Raw. Rich Swan has also been out because he's been dealing with a foot issue. Eric Rowan, it was reported, was actually at the Performance Center, and he will be back in action uh, recovering, you know, recovered from a torn rotator cuff. Now, does that mean that Eric Rowan comes back and realigns with Bray Wyatt and Randy Orton, or does Eric Rowan come back and maybe reunite with his former tag team partner, Luke Harper? Uh, very interesting things to keep an eye on. Uh, Hideo Itami is off the injured list. The return of Itami is imminent. We probably will see him back just in time for maybe NXT TakeOver Orlando, if not sooner. I think uh, getting Itami back is good for NXT, which uh, has been pretty good, but has been a little flat as of late. Now, for those of you that have been wondering why I haven't been covering NXT on MTR, it's usually because I don't get a chance to see NXT till later in the week, and um, I don't want to fast forward through it just to, to get you guys a recap of something that you guys have seen. Raw, SmackDown, and 205 Live just end up happening in order before we tape, so I figured, you know, I'm sure somebody was going to ask, so there is the answer to that. Another guy who's been off television who many of you haven't seen is Kane, which many of us were expecting to see in the Royal Rumble. That is not the case. Uh, Kane has actually been working, you know, some live events, but he's been out of action because he's been dealing with a variety of small nagging injuries. But, you know, the guy's 49 years old and he's been performing consistently for such a long time. So I think he's due for a break. <laughs> can't, can't, can't fault the guy for that. On the Austin Aries injury report, uh, you know, we know that Austin Aries suffered that really brutal orbital bone break. Um, all signs point to him being pretty much cleared and ready to go. It's just a matter of when you want to pull the trigger. Um, a lot of people are probably hoping to see Neville and Aries uh, square off 
possibly for the Cruiserweight title at WrestleMania. Wrestling Observer mentioned that, as, as did a couple of other sites. And I kind of feel they've been going in that direction just because of the way that Aries has been conducting himself with the Cruiserweights as of late. So uh, definitely something to keep an eye on. This week's uh, What the Fuck Wrestling News. It's been, on, uh, it's been a, a, a couple of months since we've had a, a WTF story. But this one, ladies and gentlemen, is a doozy. As many of you know, Paige has been on suspension for wellness, but also injured. And um, part of that is because of her relationship with Alberto Del Rio, which obviously has been a factor in the way that management in WWE has been viewing her. But nonetheless, uh, it's been interesting because, you know, Del Rio has been making the rounds as head of Combate Americas alongside Paige, you know, the first lady of Combate Americas. And, um, it's uh it's been interesting because Paige actually did a uh she was questioned by TMZ about you know just different things and she was actually asked about MMA and she said that when her WWE career is over she could see herself doing MMA because she quote unquote enjoys the training. Of course this led to everybody going, "Oh my god, Paige is going to fight in the cage." Who knows. But I wouldn't be shocked if it did happen. But the interesting thing was that the same week that that came out was an announcement that The Rock's Seven Bucks Productions, working in conjunction with WWE Studios, is going to actually be doing a film based on the life of Paige's family, uh, which is obviously the Night Wrestling family, which is Paige and um, her mom, her dad, and I believe her brother all wrestle. Um, Steven Merchant, who many of you know from The Office and Hello Ladies, is going to be writing, directing, and executive, pro- and you know, handling the executive production duties. For the project, but it's crazy because we're going to see, uh, you know, a, a, what's essentially a Paige's life story on the big screen, even though she's at odds with WWE and the film is being done in partnership with WWE Studios. That is some serious WTF because, again, you know, Paige's her entire relationship with Del Rio has been uh, a point of, of conflict with WWE and. You know, there's rumors of substance abuse problems, plus the injuries, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I know WWE would not want to cut Paige loose because any promotion would scoop her up immediately. Um, you know, she's an incredible talent. She still has that WWE fame that surrounds her, and her family is legendary. So it's not like she can't get a job. Uh, we'll see what happens. We'll be monitoring this very, very closely. Uh, the film is going to be titled Fighting With My Family. Um which was also the name of a documentary that was done on Paige's family as well. So, like I said, once we get additional details, release dates, additional casting, etc., we will let you guys know. Some good news for TNA Impact or Impact Wrestling, since TNA is slowly being phased out. Uh, TNA is working on an agreement to uh, work with Pro Wrestling Noah, with N-O-A-H, Pro Wrestling Noah is how I always know it. Um, They're going to be working together for the foreseeable future, the first collaboration is going to see some of the Impact Wrestling's some of Impact Wrestling's performers head to Noah's Yokohama event in March. As of right now, we don't know who's going to be coming over from Noah to compete in TNA, but well, Impact Wrestling. I got to get used to just calling it Impact Wrestling and not TNA. But this is the first time that I've actually reported something that's actually good for the promotion. We know that they've been going through. All their stuff with you know the anthem we, with the anthem acquisition, Dixie Carter being phased out, talent just being unhappy. Which, by the way, uh, the Hardys and Drew Galloway's contracts, I believe, are going to be expiring uh, or have expired, and they have not been re-signed. So you guys better get on that because the Hardys they would they could easily get a Hall of Fame induction and a re-sign in the blink of an eye. You better get on that because Vince Vince and Co. definitely are not going to fuck around in terms of trying to get the Hardys back because that's that's easy money for them. You know, a couple of some merch, maybe some broken stuff. If you want to go that route, a Hall of Fame thing, maybe a Legends deal, boom, done. So get on that Impact Wrestling. Don't lose the Hardys because they're probably one of the better parts of current Impact Wrestling programming. That's for damn sure. All right. So to close things out, let's get into this weekend's Elimination Chamber. I want to give you guys my predictions Uh, We know that Becky Lynch and Mickey James will be on that card as Alexa Bliss and um, Naomi. So we're going to start with with that match with Mickey James and Becky Lynch. I think that as much as Becky Lynch definitely needs 
to be the more dominant force in this feud. I think Mickey James is going to come away the victor, maybe with help from Alexa Bliss. We know that this is probably going to build towards Mickey James challenging for the title, and I have no problem with it. I like Becky Lynch. I think that she can bounce back quickly, and I think having Mickey James, you know, get a pay-per-view win is a good way to get her established, or, or in this case, reestablished on the SmackDown women's roster. Natalia and Nikki Bella's feud is probably going to come to a head and maybe lead into something bigger. I probably am going to, you know, go against my better judgment here, and I'm going to say that Nikki Bella is probably going to win this, uh, even though you could probably give us a bigger payoff with maybe her and Natalia at Mania or something bigger. Um, I do feel that Nikki Bella is going to come away the victor just because it's, it, it, it's Nikki Bella is the golden child. You know, she's executive producer now on, I believe, Total Divas and Total Bellas. So, you know, the mainstreaming of Nikki Bella is in full effect and WWE is going to ride that gravy train until the wheels fall off. And as a result of that, I see Nikki Bella coming away the victor. Your SmackDown Tag Team Championship will be defended in a Tag Team Turmoil match, which will have American Alpha, The Usos, Slater and Rhino, uh, The Fashion Police, a.k.a. Brizongo, take on The Ascension and The Vaud Villains. Everybody's scrapping. Everybody's fighting. Um, honestly, like I said when I was discussing SmackDown, the smart money would be to leave the belt on American Alpha, but you can also put them on The Usos, and that's not a bad deal either. I would take either one of those in this case, but... I'd be, I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to lie and say that I think, it, you know, the Usos have a shot, but probably the smart money is they're going to keep it on American Alpha to give American Alpha that big WrestleMania showcase. Now, does that mean that we'll see American Alpha and the Usos with some sort of a stipulation at Mania? It is possible. But right now, I think that the American Alpha is going to walk away with, you know, they're going to retain their titles this Sunday. Now, the SmackDown Women's Championship. Alexa Bliss has done a pretty solid job as champion. Uh, Naomi's being groomed for this run. I think Naomi's going to come away the victor, and we're going to give Naomi that big moment unless we let Alexa Bliss retain, and then we set up a big uh, women's match at Mania with maybe Naomi, Mickey James, Becky Lynch, and Alexa Bliss, maybe a fatal four-way, and maybe Naomi will get her WrestleMania moment. But um, I'm going to go out on a limb here, and I'm going to say that Naomi's going to win the belt and then Naomi's going to defend the belt at Mania in some sort of a of a you know multi women uh, match with some sort of a stipulation. We'll see what happens, but I'm going to stick with Naomi on this one. The Elimination Chamber, of course, the big one. WWE Championship up for grabs. AJ Styles, The Miz, Ambrose, Bray Wyatt, Baron Corbin, and John Cena. As much as I felt that Cena retaining and going on to face Randy Orton would be a no brainer. Uh, given what's been going on lately, I would not be shocked if Bray Wyatt walked out of the Elimination Chamber as your WWE Champion, and I have no problem with that. If I had to go with a second option, it would probably be AJ recapturing the belt. But I'm gonna go out. I'm gonna go out with uh, with Bray Wyatt as my pick. I think that Bray Wyatt is due. He's a stellar talent. He's improved so much over the last year or so. And I think his work with Randy Orton and Luke Harper has been really good. And I think that the, the, the story that's been created with him and Randy Orton is going to lead to something very, very interesting at WrestleMania. Also, if in, in the event that it were, like I said, AJ Styles, I think AJ would, would be more than capable of putting on a stellar match with Randy Orton as well. But I kind of feel that, that Bray Wyatt is due, and that may be the case this Sunday, and we may see Bray Wyatt and Randy Orton at WrestleMania, and then maybe Ambrose, Miz, and Corbin will settle their differences in some sort of a match, and who knows with John Cena, maybe another another round with AJ Styles, we'll see what happens, but I'm I'm going to go against the, the curve here, and I'm going to say that, that Bray Wyatt will get that title opportunity, he, he will get that title this Sunday, we'll see what happens. In any case, those predictions will close out the wrestling segment, and they'll close out this week's show. So I've given you guys my take on MMA and wrestling. As always, I'd love to hear yours. Feel free to reach out on social media. You can find my take radio on Twitter at my take radio, and you can find rage works on a multitude of, uh, you know, multiple, let me rephrase that multiple social media outlets, including Facebook, Twitter, Google plus, um, Instagram, Snapchat, etc. You can find links for all of our social media 
in the show notes for this episode. And as always, if you have any questions, concerns, or would like to be a guest on a future episode of My Take Radio, you can email me, mtrhost at mytakeradio.com or rich at rageworks.net. If you happen to want to reach out to us and you're on the site, we also have a contact form there that you can use. And we're going to be doing some really cool stuff in the coming weeks with uh, some different guests going forward. Uh, I'll keep you guys posted with who in particular and, uh, you know, maybe, maybe it'll be some, some wrestlers, you know, maybe it'll be some independent talent, but, um, we're, we're going to start putting some really cool shit together in a couple of weeks and I hope you guys enjoy it. All right, guys, thank you guys for joining us for this week's MMA and wrestling edition of my take radio. Remember MTR 400 is right around the corner, March 1st, and that will be an MMA and wrestling edition of MTR live. So Thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you guys for hitting that download button, and I will see you guys later. Peace. My Take Radio is part of the RageWorks Podcast Network, bringing you the best rants about gaming, entertainment, and the works. To find out more, visit us at RageWorks.net.